Okay. So there were a number of Mariner missions to Mars. Um, the first ones were flyby missions to Mars. And then there was a Mariner mission to Mars that was an orbiter mission. About what time frame are we talking about here for the first Mariner missions to Mars? Fifties too early. Sixties. Sixties is right. Okay, so uh, just one last look at Mars before we start sending probes there about the best observational uh, material we have on Mars before we start sending spacecraft uh, would be represented by these photographs from the Lowell Observatory uh, that were taken by uh, Slipher, one of Lowell's colleagues who continued to work in the Lowell Observatory and maintained the Lowell Observatory um, following the death of Lowell, who died, I forget when, um, sometime in the 20s, I believe. Uh, Lowell Observatory is still an active observatory today. Uh, it's a very nice spot in Flagstaff for doing um, telegra uh, telescopic observations. And uh, I've had this idea, I would really like to take a group of students from the class out to northern Arizona over spring break to go look at the Lowell Observatory, to go to the Grand Canyon, to look at you know, tectonic processes and erosion, to look at meteor crater, but I've never been able to figure out how to uh, set this up so you guys can all pay for it and, and have enough people to go. But how many of you would be interested in a spring break trip to northern Arizona? Okay. I don't think I'll be able to do it this time around, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll keep pushing at it. Uh, but anyway, Lowell Observatory, these, these are the kinds of uh, data that would be what's available um, before we start sending probes to Mars. Again, it's a focus on albedo features. The, what we can tell in the telescope are these markings of light and dark on the surface, I'm trying to interpret what they mean. Uh, not only just the lightness and darkness, but also some color variation you see across the globe. But that's about it. Uh, there's other research going on, uh, spectrographic measurements, where um, researchers are collecting the light that is coming from Mars to Earth, capturing it in a telescope, splitting that light up into, through a tele, uh, spectrograph to try to make some estimates about, well, how much oxygen is there actually in the, in the atmosphere of Mars? Is there water vapor showing up in the spectrograph of Mars? And we'll, um, we'll uh, try to do some spectro spectrometry work later in the semester. I spent this morning talking with some folks up in the Chem Board of Study to see what we could do with some of their, their equipment. But over this course of this time, Mars started becoming less and less likely uh, as a abode of life. Uh, it's clear that the more people studied from Mars from Earth, looking through spectroscopes and so forth, that you know, the density of the atmosphere is not, no, nowhere near the density of the atmosphere in the Earth. There's questions about whether or not there is water vapor or oxygen showing up in the uh, spectrographic analysis of the atmosphere of Mars. Um, there are some reports that people have identified the spectrographic signature of chlorophyll in the light they collect from Mars, which made people excited, of course, because you know chlorophyll means, well, maybe there are Martian plants. Um, but the idea of uh, you know, an advanced ancient civilization, as, as Lowell was talking about, was to some extent in the scientific community receding further and further into the mist. Okay. So our first attempts to explore other planets beyond the moon uh, there's some work in sending probes to the moon in the 50s and so forth, but in terms of planetary exploration, that really begins in the 60s. Uh, 
We're in a big Cold War race with the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, and so the first real program by NASA for exploring other planets is the Mariner program. Uh, Mariner 1 and 2 were sent to Venus. Um, Mariner 1, because it's in red there, indicates a failed mission. Uh, Mariner 3 and 4 were directed to Mars. Again, Mariner 3 um, didn't survive getting very far out of Earth's orbit. The payload fairing that protect, protects the spacecraft during uh, the launch and journey through the atmosphere didn't um, detach from the rocket. So the probe could not extend its solar panels and it basically became junk uh, floating around the sun. Mariner 4 did work. It was our first successful flyby mission to Mars. So what's a flyby mission? Flies by the planet. Okay. So it's like a drive-by shooting except it's uh, photos that are being taken and other observations and uh, uh, and then once uh, Mariner 4 flies by Mars what happens? It just continues circling the Sun. So Mariner 4 is still out there in the solar system orbiting the Sun. Uh, if we uh, well it's you know, dead piece of American technology circling the sun uh, forever, essentially. Uh, Mariner 5 was again to, to Venus. Uh, 6 and 7 were again uh, flyby missions. In this case, both of them succeeded. And so we've got two uh, missions following up on the initial mission of Mariner 4. Um, and then 8 and 9 were also targeted at Mars, but... Uh, Eight never made it. Uh, Mariner nine is the first orbiter mission, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. What's what's the advantage of an orbiter mission versus a flyby? You can continuously take pictures rather than it takes pictures once and then it's just junk. Yeah. So precisely, you're in orbit. You can monitor the total globe of the planet, depending on the orbit you're in, and you can do it for a long time. You can collect repeated measures. Uh, you can see changes in the planet over time. Why would they bother doing flyby missions for three, four, six, and seven then? Why not go into orbit? Didn't know how. They were cautious. What do you have to do to go into orbit? You have to slow down enough for the planet to capture you. And that requires fuel. Fuel is weight. And so it's a lot easier to send uh, flyby missions past the planet. We currently have a mission on the way to Pluto, which is now considered a dwarf planet. Uh, it is not an orbiter. There's no way that even with modern rocket technology, we could put enough mass on the orbiter to actually slow it down enough for Pluto to capture it. So we are still doing flyby missions even today if they you know, make most sense, if the, you know, the costs and the benefits. The benefit of just having the mission, the, um, uh, the, the Pluto mission go back, go by Pluto and take observations um, the one time is sufficient to make the mission worthwhile. Same thing for these early missions to Mars and to um, Venus. Um, in fact, I don't think any of the Mariner missions to Venus or the one to Mercury, none of them were, were orbiter missions. They were all flyby missions. Okay, so here's what Mariner 4 looked like. Uh, those of you who've read about Mariner 4 in the pile text, uh, it's a decent description of you know, the overall aims of the mission, but uh, it doesn't really give you a, a handle for, for what some of the nitty-gritty is. So, uh, fairly standard spacecraft architecture. There is a chassis, essentially, that all the instruments and control panel, control units and, and mechanisms are put onto. Uh, 
these panels that are sticking out from the spacecraft, what do you expect those to be? Solar panels for the power. Um, your phone is probably smarter than Mariner 4. I'm sure your phones are all smarter than Mariner 4 and, collect, and can actually collect and store more data. But here's, you know, for our first foray to Mars, here are the instruments that, um, that NASA sent, uh, JPL in particular, camera. So what, what's the camera going to get us? Pictures. Pictures that are going to be a hot, lot higher quality than anything we can do from telescopes on the ground here because the probe is so much closer. So it's really, compared to the lenses and so forth that we have on, in the telescopes on the ground, the optics <coughs> in the camera in Mariner 4, pretty crappy. But because it's so close to the planet, uh, it's going to get us better pictures than, uh, than we can get from the telescopes on the ground. Colin? Yeah. How did we get the how do we get the pictures back? Because this is pre-digital. Okay? This camera is a modified TV camera, a modified analog TV camera that stored the images onto a tape recorder on the spacecraft. And then after, so you got to imagine, the craft is speeding by the planet. It's not slowing down to take pictures. So the camera has, the spacecraft has to know when it is close enough to start capturing all this information. And then you essentially you have to start the tape recorder that the camera images are going to be stored on, turn on the TV camera, and basically download those analog signals onto the tape recorder until the tape runs out. So Mariner 4 got about 20 and a half pictures. And those are stored on the tape recorder, on the tape, on the spacecraft. And it's not until after the, all the hectic activity of the flyby is over with that they command the tape recorder to rewind and then gradually over a period of days send the data from the pictures down. So that analog data on the tape recorder has to be converted into essentially analog radio signals that can be captured by the deep space network and then laboriously reconstructed into the images that we'll see. Uh, there's an uh, instrument uh, studying the com uh, cosmic dust. It's basically just something that <coughs> is exposed as the spacecraft is going between Earth and Mars and every time it hits, runs into a, a dust grain that will trigger a little electrical signal and so they can measure you know, how, not, how much not a vacuum is, the vacuum of space is. So if you're actually on the way from Earth to Mars, you run into dust grains that are floating out there. You run into stray, um, you know, cosmic rays and so forth. So we've got an, um, um, an instrument to measure that. The magnetic fields. So there's a magnetometer on the spacecraft that will would respond to the magnetic field around Mars, if Mars has one. At this point, we don't know. At this point, we have very little idea about what, what the environment is, of space is really like, because these are some of the first probes we sent from Earth to another planet. We don't know what level of cosmic radiation there is. We don't know what level of dust there is out in the vacuum of space. We don't know um, you know, radiation levels, any of that stuff. So they send a fairly diverse suite of instruments on this first set of probes, one of which succeeds. And many of them are actually not targeted at Mars, but they are targeted at the space environment more generally. Um, this radio occultation experiment is, is interesting. It's actually not a separate instrument, but as the probe flies by Mars, it will, the path of it takes it behind the planet before it comes out on the other side. Okay. So you imagine you know, Mariner's coming in from the Earth, and it's flying around, it goes behind the back side of the planet and out the other side. Uh, during that time period when 
Mariner 4 is disappearing from view, it's constantly sending radio signals back, if Mars has no atmosphere, what will happen to the disappearance of the radio signal? If, Mar if, the, if Mariner is still, is not behind Mars yet, there's going to be a strong radio signal, right? If there's no atmosphere, when is that radio, radio signal going to disappear? Immediately when it passes behind Mars. If Mars has a thick atmosphere, what instead is going to happen to the disappearance of the radio signal? Atmospheres actually can absorb and block some of the radio signal. So if Mars has a thick atmosphere like the Earth, rather than the radio signal just abruptly disappearing as soon as Mars, uh, as soon as Mariner you know, goes behind Mars, what instead will happen is the radio signal will have gradually attenuate, gradually get weaker, and then disappear when the, planet, when the probe goes behind. So making use of the radio that's already on the system, you can actually make some me uh, measurements of how thick the Martian atmosphere is. Which is kind of cool. So this was a flyby, 1965. Uh, this is the schematic of the of the spacecraft. I won't spend a lot of time talking about it. But again, solar panels. You've got the TV camera down here uh, on the um, lower side of the spacecraft that can be pointed toward the planet. Uh, antennas for communicating back to Earth. Uh, magnetometer is up here on the antenna. So, as someone building a, a robotic probe to explore another planet, you have to you know get the scientists and the engineers together, decide what the capabilities are going to be that are needed, uh, plan out those instruments, figure out what kind of power they're going to require. Can all the instruments be run at the same time based on the amount of power that the solar panels can produce? Or do we have to you know, sequence the activity of one instrument versus the other? How do we keep the probe from overheating? Because if you've got solar panels that are collecting solar radiation, there's no breeze out in space to cool things off, right? The only way to get rid of excess heat is to radiate it off into space. So many probes have to have specific radiator systems that can be controlled to, you know, to control how much heat is given off into space to keep the probe from getting too hot, but also to keep it from getting too cold. Because our instruments don't like to work when they go beyond specs too far. Okay, so this Mariner 4 again was a flyby mission, and this is not going to come through very quick, good in the room here. But uh, basically, as I said, it captured about 20 images that represent the part of the planet that was underneath the probe as it sped by. So, voila, this is the first close-up view of Mars from Mariner 4. Um, it is better than what we saw through the telescopes from Earth, but it's still not what we're used to today. What do you see? It kind of looks like a sonogram. Kind of looks like a sonogram, okay. About the same level of resolution. So, you've got, again, this is black and white TV camera. So you're just collecting uh, lightness and darkness. What, what's here? Edge of, Edge of the planet. So this is space up here, and Mars down here. And do you see any features, any structures, anything you recognize? Michael. Like below the P here? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's first picture of Mars shows a fairly decent sized crater. Now if you were thinking of a picture of the Earth, what might you expect to see? 
might expect to see water. Clouds. Clouds. In terms of landforms, what might you expect to see? Mountains. Mountains. Continents, if there's water, if there's oceans, maybe there's, you know, you might see river systems, you might see volcanoes, you know, lots of things you could, could see. And none of that was known before we send the probe by. So one thing we do see is a crater. Um, you know, are these clouds? Is it just a brighter part of the surface? Again, it's better than what we saw through the telescope, but it's still kind of crappy. But it's the first, so. Okay, here's, here's another. Of course, I've given it away. So what do we see in the picture here? <laughs> Craters. Okay, so it's a little bit clearer that we can see a fair number of craters. Maybe down here. So if you were, you know, in a high altitude jet and you took a picture of the Earth, would you expect to see a lot of craters? No. I mean, there are some distinctive craters like Meteor Crater out in northern Arizona, but if you're flying over Iowa or you know the Midwest and you take a picture, you might see circular, or flying over Kansas, you might see big circles from crop irrigation, but we don't tend to see a lot of craters on the Earth. Is that because the Earth never gets smacked from outer space? No. What happens to craters on the Earth? Uh, smaller incoming impactors will burn up in the atmosphere, but something large enough to make craters this size would go through the Earth's atmosphere like it wasn't there and create structures like Meteor Crater or um, Chichilub Crater, which killed off the dinosaurs. Um, what happens to our landforms over time? How? Erosion. So we've got active processes on the Earth that over time gradually erase structures, break them down. And so, you know, you always have to have new mountains being built because old mountains are eroding away. Um, new volcanic uh, cinder cones will eventually erode away. Impact craters on the Earth will eventually erode away. And so, the fact that we don't see a lot means that you know, Earth has clearly gotten smacked a lot of times over the course of its history, but processes have occurred to erase those craters and replace them with other more active landforms like mountain building and uh, river channel creation and things like that. The fact that we see a lot of craters on Mars begins to tell us what about Mars? It doesn't have probably a lot of erosion. It's probably less geologically active. So again, this is just another one of the pictures. Here's another. So picture after picture that Mariner 4 showed, kind of dominated by a cratered landscape. You know, here's Mariner Crater, which is a relatively large, but somewhat indistinct crater. I and mean, we've got craters on top of craters in these pictures. Here's just uh, a couple of pictures that have been um, um, morphed together uh, and cleaned up a little bit. And again, you see uh, lots of, of crater morphologies in this region. This does not remind us of Earth. What body in our neighborhood does this remind us of? The moon. the moon. And that's, you know, these pictures come down and that's the first thing that people think about. Mars looks a whole lot like what we expect from the moon. A heavily cratered landscape. And are we interested in life on the moon?
So all these people are interested in finding life on Mars. See these first pictures from Mariner 4, and major depression sets in. Yeah, not, not exactly, but um, very disappointing. I mean, these are our first science results back from Mars, and they're very disappointing. But that's what Mars is. So, pictures aside, Mariner 4 showed us that Mars has a relatively thin atmosphere. Uh, that radio occultation <coughs> experiment we talked about showed very little attenuation of the, radio, of the radio signal as Mars was approaching the edge, as the probe was approaching the edge of Mars. And so, that lack of attenuation of the radio signal really let the researchers know that there's not a whole lot of atmosphere here. It's less than 1% the thickness, the density of, of the atmosphere on the Earth. Daytime temperatures that were measured were minus 100 degrees Celsius, not very conducive to life. The magnetometer found no magnetic field. And what does the magnetic field on the Earth do for us? Gives us direction. Gives us direction. Hummingbirds, birds and, and bees and so forth can find their way around. Diverts, wind. Diverts the solar wind. So uh, the magnetic field around the Earth protects the surface of the Earth from a lot of the incoming charged particles and cosmic rays that are coming from the sun and from deep space. Mars has no global magnetic field, which means, the sur and very thin atmosphere as well, which means the surface of the planet is just bathed in the solar wind and w with what all that means. So after Mariner 4, people thought, well, Mars is kind of like a very lunar structure with maybe some wind to blow the dust around. But not to be totally disappointed, uh, NASA followed this up, JPL followed this up with Mariner 6 and 7. Very similar probes to Mariner 4, but focused strictly on Mars. No, none of these, um, let's measure what space is like in between Earth and Mars. So all the instrument package is focused on Mars. Uh, two cameras, digital tape recorder at this point. Uh, Nice addition here is the infrared spectrometer, which allows identification of materials through remote sensing. And we'll talk about some of that. Uh, ultraviolet spectrometer as well. Again, they did the radio occultation experiment and so forth. The spacecraft bus, very similar to Mariner 4. Solar panels coming out. Uh, this a kind of hexagonal chassis for putting the instruments and control systems onto. Mariner 4 had little vanes that were sticking out from the solar panels to try to do some solar sailing on the solar wind to uh, adjust the trajectory slightly by having those kind of like a sailing ship in, in on the earth. Those were nuked for uh, Mariner 6 and 7. These were late 60s. And again, flyby missions, so they can't, can't look at the whole planet. Uh, and so here's the ground coverage for the uh, photographs from, Mars 6, uh, from Mariner 6 and 7. But again, the uh, terrain looks very cratered. I uh, won't take the time to draw all the craters on here, but when you put these together, it looks very much like the kind of terrain that Mariner 4 saw. Again, here are some more uh, cleaned up pictures, really showing the abundance of craters in the terrain that Mariner 6 and 7 um, photographed. Again, these were kind of uh, restricted to equatorial and southern hemisphere sections of Mars, given the trajectories that the 
probes were going by the planet. And again, so mostly cratered views. They did notice with the slightly higher quality uh, photos that, yeah, there are a lot of craters there, but these craters are a lot more weathered than craters we see on the moon. So Mars clearly is not as active geologically as the Earth is, but it's not quite as dead as the moon. You know, it's like the Monty Python skit. I'm not dead yet, you know? That one. Uh, there were some smoother areas, and any areas that aren't filled with a lot of craters, as we'll look at next time, um, are, are areas that clearly have some younger surface going on. So, um, so that was uh, interesting, and this identification of chaotic terrain where there were some pictures that just showed you know, blocks of, of landscape kind of scattering all over the place, which was difficult, very difficult to interpret geologically from just the information that came back from Mariner 6 and 7. But clearly, uh, a lot more photographic coverage for Mariner 6 and 7 than with Mariner 4. We're still not seeing mountain ranges. I mean, there's nothing like the Alps. There's nothing like the Rocky Mountains showing up. We're, we're not seeing, um, uh, you know, any of those landscape features on the scale that we would expect to see them on the Earth. A big addition to uh, Mariner 6 and 7 was the inclusion of the infrared spectrometers. And um, I can't take the time today to go through this in detail. But you, many of you are probably familiar with the idea of the electromagnetic spectrum. We've got uh, you know, visible light here in the middle. And if you go to longer and longer wavelengths, lower energy um, particles, lower energy waves, you get into the infrared, you get into the microwave and radio parts of the spectrum. And if you go shorter and shorter, you go ultraviolet and then gamma and x-rays. But this, this uh, electromagnetic magnetic spectrum will interact with materials. So this is blue because the material is absorbing non-blue wavelengths of visible light. So different materials are going to absorb and emit different parts along the spectrum. And the infrared, spectra, the infrared part of the spectrum is very useful for identifying minerals, as we'll see later when we're talking about uh, Spirit and Opportunity and the Curiosity rover. Uh, but it's also very useful for identifying gases in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide will absorb particular wavelengths of infrared light. Oxygen and ozone will, will absorb different wavelengths of infrared light. So based on what wavelengths of infrared light are being absorbed by the light going through the Martian atmosphere, the infrared spectrometer instrument can identify how much oxygen is in the atmosphere, how much water vapor is in the atmosphere, how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, is there, is there any ozone? And um, so without even going down to the planet and collecting a sample of the gas, just by looking at the light that's coming off of the atmosphere, the infrared light, um, an, in an instrument like the infrared spectrometer can identify what materials are in that atmosphere. It turns out it is almost all carbon dioxide, as we talked about earlier in the Mars overview. There are some traces of water vapor, but not a lot. Ozone, nitrogen not detected. You know, nitrogen is the major component of the atmosphere on the Earth. Um, essentially zero nitrogen in the atmosphere of Mars. So people were trying for decades to do this kind of measurement from the Earth, but it's very difficult to do this from the Earth because all the light from Mars is coming through the Earth's atmosphere. 
So if you detect the presence of water vapor on the surface of the Earth in the, spect in the spectrum that you're getting back from Mars, then how do you know that's just not due to the water vapor that's in the Earth's atmosphere? By actually sending the probe there, we can make a much cleaner measurement, and what we find is atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide with some water vapor, a little, some ice crystals, carbon dioxide ice crystals, water ice crystals. Uh, so again, very thin atmosphere, composition much different than, than what's on the Earth. Okay, so generally, how would you characterize our view of Mars after these first flyby missions? Dead planet. Okay. And that was kind of the general consensus among the scientific community after these initial missions. Uh, interest in Mars dropped quite a bit after this. Uh, but fortunately, there was another set of missions, Mariner 8 and 9, already in the pipeline, already committed, so uh, we sent these orbiters as well.